Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Justin Peters. I hope that this finds you and your family doing well today. I want to thank you so much for joining me for this podcast. I'm interviewing KC Butner today, the pastor of Beulah Baptist Church in Winter Garden, Florida, outside of Orlando. I've interviewed KC several times before on this channel, uh, talking about the problems in the SBC and uh, specifically First Baptist Church Orlando and more on that later. But uh, in this program, we'll primarily be talking about the SBC as a whole. And Casey went to the Southern Baptist Convention a couple of weeks ago as of this recording and came back, took some of his members as messengers with him, but came back uh, with the absolute conviction that they must leave the SBC. There's just, they realize that there's no way of riding the ship. It is too far gone. There is undeniable liberal drift. We're going to talk about all of that. And at this point, it is a violation of his conscience for he and his church, for him and his church to uh, remain affiliated with the SBC. And so we're going to talk about all those reasons. He's going to talk about what he witnessed at the Southern Baptist Convention, the things that were done, the compromise, all of these things. Uh, he's going to get drilled down into a lot of specifics. Uh, throughout this video, I will insert some clips from the Southern Baptist Convention so you can see what he is talking about for yourself. It is undeniable. And I, I want you to watch this video, uh, and I'm hoping that this will be a, a helpful tool for a lot of other churches out there because I know that there are some good Southern Baptist churches that are pastored by some good men some of these men are friends of mine, but and I know a lot of these men, a lot of these brothers, they they see the same things that I do, that Casey does, that so many others do, that really all of the conservatives in the SBC see. They 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 see these issues, but and it has become at this point, it is so undeniable that it has become um, a, an issue with their conscience. I think a lot of these faithful men, faithful pastors in the SBC, I think they realize that there is no way to right the ship. They realize that um, that they really need to get out, but they don't know how to get out. They don't know how to really educate their, their congregation, their flock, to make them aware of the problems that are in the SBC. So I'm hoping that this interview will be a helpful tool for that and, and for those purposes. So. If you're one of those brothers, if you are, um, if you see these issues and you know um, that it's it's time to go, and you know that there's just no way for the SBC uh, to be saved and for the for the direction to be changed, to use that phraseology, then uh, please do watch this video. Share the link with people in your church. Have them watch it. Uh, please do watch it all the way through. There's a lot here. I know it's kind of a long interview, but there's a lot here. And um, I, I think and I hope and pray it, it will be helpful. Um, and, and I take no joy in this. You'll hear me say this in, in the interview. I take no joy that the SBC has come to this point. And I say that as someone who was in the SBC for the first 37 years of my life. Uh, but this is just the reality of the fact. Um, and also, at the end of the video, I will tease an upcoming video that will be further um, proof of, of everything that we're saying and, and, and shocking, quite honestly. Um, so anyway, that'll be at the end. That's all I'll say about that right now. Okay. Thank you very much, dear ones. Without any further delay, here's Casey. Well, Casey, brother, thank you very much for coming back on my program. You're starting to be a regular guest here, but, uh, I really appreciate your friendship and uh, especially your stand for truth. And so the reason uh, you are back with me today is to talk about the decision you've made regarding um, you and your church as to your participation or lack thereof in the, in the SBC, whether or not that will continue. You preached a sermon this past Sunday as of this recording on, um, what was it, June 26th from 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 19, entitled The Truth About the SBC. And um, you preached this right on the heels of returning from the Southern Baptist Convention in Anaheim, California. So, um, brother, I'll leave it with you. Tell us, tell us your thoughts, um, what you experienced at the 
convention and the decision that you and your church have made? Well, certainly it's great to be back, Justin. And I'm very thankful for our messengers that went with me to the Southern Baptist Convention. And we decided to um, hold back some of our cooperative funds so that we could send a full roster to the convention. And uh, we felt that was a wise decision because the North American Mission Board was using cooperative funds the last year to send their church planters and such. So if our money was going towards that anyway, but being forwarded towards a narrative that we didn't agree with, then obviously the best thing to do would be to be able to vote the best that you possibly could. So nevertheless, we, we took a, a full roster up there and I'm so thankful for the men that came. Um, the whole convention was wrapped with joy because of the extended time with these guys. And in fact, we went up early and went to Grace Community Church and got to meet uh, John MacArthur and Good. talk with him. We went to Phil Johnson's uh, Bible study there. Uh, just a few people in attendance, somewhere around 800 to 1,000 in his Sunday school class. Right, and, it's a big class. Uh, that's, yes, it's great. He wasn't speaking. Bodie Bachman was scheduled to speak. His flight, flight was delayed, uh, but Mike Riccardi knocked it out of the park. Yeah. Could not have been more impressed. I love Mike Riccardi. He is uh, he is a good, good brother and just uh, one of the finest expositors you'll find anywhere and um, yeah, so I'm, I'm glad you got to hear him. I'm glad. Yes. You got him. So we had such a good time at Grace Community Church. We were all looking at each other in this uh, small rental car. You can imagine a bunch of guys packed in a small rental vehicle going back to our hotel, and it kind of dawned on us. I wonder if the Lord has kind of blessed us up front because he knows what we're going into. Huh. <laughs> and so, right. Well, <laughs> Did we ever um, experience that? Uh, you know, Nashville was a fiasco, um, and we just saw the same things again and again and, and again there in Anaheim. Um, and from our messenger's perspective, so that perhaps it wouldn't be tainted to maybe new viewers, these guys have, you know, um, I believe one had been to an annual convention before. And sure. so three guys, it was their first time. And them going to see uh, the same things that we are discerning was very affirming. So the yeah. term shenanigans, uh, you know, wrong. Uh, this has been hijacked. These types of phrases were being muttered there as we're in there it's like so it's very obvious when the moderator uh, has the ability to turn off a microphone and ignore a messenger and yep. then yep. place the emphasis towards another direction and you're sitting in the crowd and you're like well that's not robert rules of order or that's not parliamentary procedure that was actually very rude yep. and to see these things was very disheartening for the messengers. And so we were really grateful for the excitement and the joy that we had around the, the long meetings. But, you know, you mentioned the title of last week's message. Um, I came home and um, we all flew back. And the first thing that we had uh, an opportunity to do was to put our messengers up on Wednesday night on a panel discussion before our people and allow them to share what they saw, what they heard, and, um, and how they saw it. And so I gave them the first you know, opportunity to speak. And so they went right down the line and, and shared with our church, with our congregation. And, um, and then at the end, um, we had one of our members raise his hand and ask, you know, what I felt about it all, because everything that I'm fixing to share is the same thing and maybe even more from what they had shared. And so I, I replied and said, I don't know if I can fit how I feel into just one little reply. So I shared some and I said, I'll tell you what, Sunday, I'll, I'll just do a full disclosure. And there on a Wednesday night, we all unanimously agreed that uh, we should leave the SBC. And so our Wednesday night core, we have a, a strong Wednesday night Bible study. And 
they are they they've been educated along the way. I have not uh, withheld details from them over the years. I've I've shared with them the truth, and we value truth. Truth is paramount. When you lose, you know, faith and trust in someone, you lose trust and truth. You lose everything. Yeah. So, nevertheless, um, I've always been one hundred percent honest. And in fact, on that note. When I when I speak with what I would call yesteryears late greats in the SBCs, those who have been around for a long time, they have handled issues well in the past behind closed doors, and they've addressed things. They've done Matthew eighteen, you know, to the best of my knowledge, and always spoken uh, positively at the pulpit. So, in handling things that way in the yesteryears era seemed to do okay. But now with the advent of social media, when a teenager can tweet or text or post anything from anywhere and you know everything around the world, you have to be transparent. You have to tell the truth. You cannot conceal um, anything. Otherwise you're perceived as a liar and not telling the truth or ignorant. And that's what I see by and large happening with good guys, with pastors who are genuinely um, good and older and, and faithful to the Lord. But those are rare compared to the SBC elites. And I'd like to share, you know, some of my thoughts. Yeah. And as we go through these topics, basically, it's just simply going to skip right across the surface on the tip of the iceberg right. of each iceberg, I would say. Right. And so, my aim in this would be simply to give some information for folks to be able to research for themselves and know exactly why I'm leaving the SBC. I want nothing to do with the direction of the Southern Baptist Convention. Not only are the means corrupted, but also the ends are corrupted. And we'll talk about that, but it's very clear to me, and we've given it our very best shot for years now, but I'm telling you, truth has been replaced with tolerance by and large. And yeah. also we're now being called to unity at any cost. And that's a high cost. Yes, that's right. And, and unity at the expense of truth is a false sense of unity. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's exactly right. So one of our messengers is um, retired from the Navy and he just gave the best illustration. And I, I can't help but share it with you now. He's a man of few words, but he's very smart. He's very articulate. And when he was asked his thoughts of the, the whole thing after we were leaving and coming back, he said, well, this SBC ship is headed fast in the wrong direction. It's got too small of a rudder to turn it around. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I, I felt that uh, very insightful and a pretty good illustration. So yeah, yeah. Uh, that's right. I, I would kind of go a little bit farther in, in my own assessment and say that it's shipwrecked. Yeah. It's, 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 it's beyond being, being able to salvage. Yeah. And we had another uh, attender on our Wednesday night say this, do you think instead of the SBC uh, waning off in its attendance. Do you think it'll grow because of its alignment with the world? And I thought that that was a very insightful thought as well. Obviously, it was a panel discussion. You got questions that can be being asked. And if that perhaps happens, Justin, I want nothing to do with that kind of success. Mm -hmm. uh, I want nothing to do with partnering with the world in all these worldly philosophies and easy believism tactics for numbers. Yeah. I don't want to do with it. So yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's not an easy decision. Um, being Southern Baptist raised and educated and, uh, and how grateful I am for everything that um, I and my family have benefited as being a part of the Southern Baptist convention is not taken lightly. I was um, called um, by Dr. Gerald Hicks when I was at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, and he said, Casey, I pastor Powers Drive Baptist Church, 
you uh, you know me well. You were called to preach underneath my ministry, and I'm getting to be an old man. This church needs a young man. Won't you consider coming? And so in the process of two years uh, later, uh, the church called me to be their pastor. And so now we've sold that facility, merged in with Beulah Baptist Church, and I've been here for five years now. And um, it's a wonderful church. I absolutely love my pastorate and I love the people and I love where I'm at. And by the way, this church that we merged in with four years ago, Beulah Baptist Church, is uh, on the oldest property for a church in Central Florida. And so our church is over 100 years old. It's a historic church. We've got a historic chapel and we have a historic cemetery. And everything is, is a part of history here. And so this is no easy decision when it comes to my history with the Southern Baptist and also the church. So obviously there's two decisions here. Um, I've announced Sunday that I want not to be a Southern Baptist pastor. I just want to be your pastor. I'm content with pastoring my local flock and feeding you guys, according to 1 Peter 5, 2. And, and, and I love being involved in our local association. And I love what God is doing here. And we can do missions personally. We have uh, a missionary coming this Sunday, and he's going to preach. And I believe our church is going to vote to support this family going to South America to plant churches and win people to Christ. And then what's going to happen is we're um, hopefully going to be able to build up a surplus so that we can fly this family back once in a while Hmm. um, for time here in central Florida. And then as well, we'll take mission trips with this family to South America. So we're going to have a personal missionary doing personal testimonies. We can personally minister to him and his family and also take personal mission trips and do this. And so one of the largest questions I've received as I've been interacting with a lot of pastors is what are you going to do? Um, How are you going to do missions? And uh, that's an easy solution. So nevertheless, there should not be any hesitancy regarding how we will exist or continue on as a church without a convention. Yeah. And so, and I'm glad you brought that up, Casey, because I, that in talking to doctrinally sound pastors who are in the SBC and they're struggling with, you know, like they their convictions, they know they need to leave. They know the SBC is beyond hope. It's as I say, as I say, it's it's not headed for God's judgment. It's under God's judgment. This is what judgment looks like. And I want to I want to get to these particulars real soon. But that's one of the common objections. Well, what about missions? You know, it's it's like they can't conceive of doing missions outside of the SBC, outside of the cooperative program, North American Mission Board, International Mission Board. They just can't conceive of it. And yet you can do missions outside of the SBC. You know, uh, our church, we have missionaries that we just support exactly like what you're talking about. We, We have missionaries that we send a check to and we support them and we hear from them. We know what they're doing and there's no middleman. Yeah, it's really beautiful. I I think too. There's um, a, a result that has happened from being codependent on a cooperative program, and that is that is this. It has said to our people, fifty thousand churches nearly, that the way you do missions is you give and sit. But that's not the Great Commission. The yeah. Great Commission. Is actually being on mission yourself. And so giving and going is the commission to make disciples. And so each of us are called to be part of the Great Commission. And so we have Christians who are not engaged in the Great Commission, but see what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. Um, yeah. You want more for them to be engaged in the gospel rather than just right. giving and paying someone else to do their job. So. Yeah. Yeah. Nevertheless, um, I'd, I'd like to read First Timothy 1, 18 and 19. And this is the commandment that I entrust unto you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight. That's what I feel like we're doing. We're, we're fighting the good fight here, keeping faith in a good conscience, which I have, 
which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Now, this idea of being shipwrecked is what I, the image that I have in my mind. And right attached to this concept in verse 20, there's two names that follow this. So among these are Hymenus and Alexander. A lot of folks are afraid of naming names. And I don't want anybody to be afraid of names because we're fixing to get into the details. And in the scriptures, we have a lot of names that are named. And yes, we do. In fact, 2 Timothy 1.15, Pygelus and Hermogenes were named by name for turning away from the gospel. And in 2 Timothy 2.17, you have Hymenius and Philetus who were gossiping, and that was equated to gang green. And then 2 Timothy 3, 8 to 13, you have two people who opposed Moses and opposed the truth. That was Janus and Jambres. Yeah. And then in 2 Timothy 4, 10, you've got Demas, who loved this present world and departed from Paul. And then in 414, you've got Alexander, who did much harm. So yeah. this is just one book with a ton of names, especially those who are involved in ministry. And again, those who are in ministry are held to a higher account. And so just to cover our basis, I, I want to read 1 Timothy 5, 19 and 20. Do not receive an accusation against an elder, except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all. And this is just simply what we're doing. We have not two or three witnesses, but an overwhelming amount of evidence to all of the things that we're going to talk about. And then after you rebuke them in the presence of all, there's a so that, which is two of my favorite words in the Bible, so that the rest will be fearful of sinning. Yeah. What we're doing is actually helping the health of churches and individual people so that they would see not how to sin. And yeah. so when we call it out, it's clearly uh, known what is right and wrong. And right now, we have a huge moderate position taking over the SBC, and they're calling themselves conservatives, but it's anything but. The word conservative has been hijacked in the SBC the same way yeah. the word rainbow has been hijacked yeah. for the LGBTQ. Yeah. And so... The conservatives would call themselves conservatives, but they're moderates and they completely justify sin. And everything that we're going to talk about, I have talked about these specifics with a, with a lot of notable pastors, with a lot of the right people, and have just simply determined that, uh, and, and by the grace of God, I've been at the right place at the right time, at the convention, at churches, at meetings, conventions, whatever conferences to be able to talk to a lot of the right people the SBC elites most would call and when you see that this moderate position this affirming position this excusism of sin position this narrative this embracement of critical race theory this unwilling to address women pastors this unwilling to address plagiarism this unwillingness to hold a yeah. uh, pastor accountability, you name it, all of these things are swept underneath the rug, you think to yourself, okay, I'm just seeing the tip of all of these icebergs, and these guys are in alignment. I see where the SBC is going. These guys are not going anywhere soon. It would take the rest of my career. I'm 42. It take another 40 years to climb up the ranks to try and make any difference in the Southern Baptist Convention. And by that time, you know, no telling where it would be. Yeah. I've been recommended to the Florida Baptist Convention three or four times now to be on the State Board of Missions, and it's been completely ignored. And, and so not even a phone call back or anything. Yeah. So it's, that's the way the system is. And if it is that way, which it is, there is just simply no reason for me to stick around and try to help it get in the right direction, especially when it's so polluted and it's heading there fast. 
I want nothing to do with the means and the ends right now. So nevertheless, um, I was encouraged by um, Charles Spurgeon's life when he was fighting against the great downgrade, the downgrade of the Baptist Union. And unfortunately, most who knew him then said that he died of a broken heart. It literally affected his health. And that liberal downgrade was just awful for him. And Justin, you know, one of the previous interviews, we've talked about First Baptist Orlando. We've talked about all these things in the SBC. These things really are rottenness to the bones. Yeah. And people suffer when they see it for what it is. And then they're a part of it. They ache and they agonize. They pray. They want to be a part. And then when you're swept underneath the rug and ignored, it's terrible. So nevertheless, this whole thing is going in a direction. And honestly, theologically, especially with soteriology, especially with exposition of preaching correctly, I, yeah. I've, I've been going in the opposite direction for a long time oh, and, yeah. and see it clearly that everything is geared and affirmed. And through pragmatism, you have all of these worldly philosophies that have crept in in every area. So I announced Sunday, I'm done. Um, I'm, I'm out and I'm yours. I'm, I'm the local churches. So now I get to give you some details. So. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, Casey, okay, so let's do that. Um, first, I'm, I'm just so glad that you you made that decision and, and this is what your church is going to do. Um, it's the right thing to do. And in, in keeping with the ship analogy, I've been telling people that, that the SBC is under the judgment of God, that this is a ship that God himself is sinking. And it, it's time for the good guys to, to realize that, that you don't want to be holding on to a ship that God mm-hmm. is taking down. Mm-hmm. So you want to let that ship go, but anyway, so right. uh, let's go through, let's go through some of these specifics as to why, why you've come to this decision. Right on. So, um, we, we've, we've read in the scriptures where elders and pastors are to be rebuked in the presence of all. So we'll talk, you know, about some of the things that Ed Litton, JD Greer, James Merritt, even Tony Evans, Rick Warren, Kevin Ezell, Johnny Hunt, and Moore have done and been involved in. And now even the SBC president, Bart Barber, and he publicly affirmed uh, Rick Warren and all of what Rick said. It was rather shameful to see that um, Ed Litton would abandon his moderation duties and um, really start amening and affirming Rick Warren as he was speaking and give the floor to Rick Warren out of parliamentary procedure and give yeah. him an unlimited amount of time. So it was um, brilliant while, on his. While shutting down Tom and Jennifer Buck, not letting yes. them talk, but giving Rick Warren free reign. What a shame. So you've got good pastors like Tom Buck and many others who are asking good, solid questions about plagiarizing women pastors. And Lytton was rude. We're in the habit of, from time to time, plagiarizing sermon content, which is prohibited by all seminaries. Sir, that is not the point of this. That is not the point of this discussion at this moment. And he cut them off and he said they were out of order, which that's not out of order. Yeah. That's a good, solid question. That, that, that ad- adheres to our Baptist faith and message and ethics and everything. So in, in scripture, but um, he cut them off and moved on and then gives the floor to Rick Warren. Rick Warren, uh, you know, he, he knows how to appeal to the world mm-hmm. and The world is craving a victimhood mentality, and that's how he opened up. He said, you know, a a man is fixing to get hung should have some last words here. And it was funny, and everybody laughed and and giggled or whatnot. But it just showed the temperature or the aura of the room and how they also craved to advocate for 
those who are maybe disenfranchised or done wrong, supposedly, in this movement. He played right into that philosophy, and he had the room literally listening on pins and needles for those few minutes. And I looked around, and everyone loved what he was saying. But he was just simply bragging on himself as if God needed him and the SBC needed him to train 1.1 million pastors, which he said was more than all of the seminaries. This gross braggadocious approach was celebrated by the messengers, which tells me very clearly that there's an idol, which I've been calling out for a long time in the SBC. That's numbers and yeah. bigness yeah. and so when that is celebrated and you're ignoring that he has ordained women for pastors when you're ignoring that he is developing a theological connection between evangelicalism and the muslim faith when you're ignoring these things that he stands for and is doing and yet celebrate the numbers. So if you say the right things and you quote the right numbers, you can literally get away with anything that you want, It's especially if it's unscriptural. So nevertheless, I came back and I shared with our church that those who could potentially make a difference as messengers who hold up you know, their ballot and they, they, they make resolutions and they come and they share their voices or whatnot, they also crave this idol of numbers. And it's clear that not only the SBC elites, right? And then the mega church pastors that I've spoken to, not all of them, but most of them are unwilling moderates. And then now you have the messengers. They're all headed in this direction. Yeah. And Rick Warren could be kind of stereotypical of the direction that the SBC is going. So that would be one reason that I, I, I'm, I'm gone. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And Rick, you know, Rick Warren, I'm, I'm struck by that. He says that he's trained 1.1 million pastors. Someone had a, a meme up. I don't know who, but it's, it's basically said that it, I mean, the only way for that to even be possible, like if, if you're a, if you walked past a bookshelf with the purpose driven life on, if you just walked past it, then you got trained to be a pastor. I mean, that's about the only way it'd be possible to train that number. <laughs> so you're qualified if you, you know, pass by, I want to, I want to put this up and post edit, but this is a tweet from Rick Warren. Now this is after the convention. He says, is life wearing you down? That's the question. Is life wearing you down? Jesus, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. That is so stunningly out of context. So after Rick Warren, this is after the convention, after Rick Warren brags about training pastors, and this is his exegesis? It, <laughs> So what kind of training are we talking about here? And this is like, I could give you thousands of examples of Rick Warren grossly taking scripture out of context. So it, right. you know, I mean, that is not talking Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Jesus is not talking about if you're, you know, if, if you got problems at the job and the boss is making you mad and you, you know, your, your dog won't quit barking and, you know, life's getting to you. That's not what this is talking about. No. So it, 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 no wonder the SBC is in such a sad state of affairs that this is the kind of training that he's talking mm -hmm. about. It's just absolutely stunning. Yeah. Did you know the secular media dubbed him as America's pastor? Yeah. Yep. So in order for that to happen, they know that he's a universalist, an interfaith guy. Yeah. And that's the only way that you could be dubbed America's pastor. Yeah. I, I describe Rick Warren, and I don't want to spend all our time on him, but he is a theological chameleon. He mm -hmm. is whoever his audience is on that particular occasion. If he's at the yeah. SBC, he's he's touting his SBC credentials. If he's with John Piper, he's reading the Puritans. If he's at the 2006 
uh, Azusa Centennial Celebration, which is the, the beginning of the you know charismatic movement, their big um, hundred year shindig that they had to celebrate the charismatic debacle. Uh, if he's yeah. there, uh, he's talk he's talking about tongues and he's he's hamming it up with Kenneth Copeland and and word faith false teachers. He's word of faith. If he's at yeah. the Islamic Society of North America. And the very fact that he was invited there speaks volumes about how he's perceived. Uh, this is a convention full of Muslims. Thousands of Muslims have gathered there, and they invite Rick Warren to come in and be their speaker. Uh, never in a million years would they invite someone like John MacArthur or Steve Lawson or Bodie Balcom or any of these guys to come in and preach because they know that those men would come in and give them the gospel. But they had no fears of Rick Warren doing that, and sure enough, he didn't. I watched the whole thing. I watched his whole address. In fact, at one point, he says, uh, you know, we need to love each other. And he says, love is a verb. And we Love is something you do. It's something that we do together. Love is a verb. Now, as the two largest faiths on this planet, Muslims and Christians, we must lead in this show each other love what, what the greatest expression of love is telling them the truth what better opportunity to present the gospel than in front of thousands of muslims if he really loved these people that's what he would have done he would have given them gospel but did he nope not even not even tangentially did he present the gospel you know and it's just oh when he's being interviewed by ewtn the roman catholic channel he talks about how Pope Francis is our Pope. It, authenticity, humility, Pope Francis is the perfect example of this. Hmm. He, is a, he is doing everything right. You see, people will listen to what we say if they like what they see. see. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as our new Pope, he was very, very symbolic. In, in fact, there's a headline here in Orange County, and I love the headline, I saved it, it said, if you love Pope Francis, you'll love Jesus. <laughs> was that, that was the headline? That was the headline. Oh. It was the headline. I saved it. I showed it to a group of priests I was uh, speaking to a while back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my Pope, you know, so he, he changes his theology like we change our socks. Wow. And, you know, that's really worth mentioning because... A lot of Southern Baptist pastors who are, by and large, trusting of the convention or not attending the convention for various reasons, they've always loved and trusted Rick Warren. He's been a lot of, you know, whom everybody has rallied around. Yeah. And this may be new news to some pastors, and it needs to get out so that we can see the truth. That's one of the biggest problems right now is how everything has been kept confusing. But um, Ed Litton gave him the floor. And um, now a little bit about Ed Litton. I was um, really, you know, floored at the fact that he has been able to plagiarize so many sermons and get away with it, removing them off of his website to the tune of a hundred or more. And then also he was um, espousing a false doctrine of the Trinity before he was a candidate to be the SBC president. And he yep. fixed that his website <laughs> before. And, and so that is the definition of hiding and lying. And yep. then it says, well, he was a co he was co pastoring the church with his wife and she spoke with him. And then at the same time, the one of the sermons that he plagiarized was JD Greer's, you know, message on saying that homosexuality will not send you to hell. Assuming it's hard for LGBTQ people to get to heaven. Where do we go wrong thinking LGBT people can't go to heaven? Homosexuality does not send you to hell. You know how I know that? Because heterosexuality does not send you to heaven. Homosexuality does not send people to hell. How do I know that? Because heterosexuality doesn't send people to heaven. So nevertheless, I'm floored at how all of these compiled sins are very blatant and obvious and yet there's so much cover for him yeah. to the tune 
of every single seminary, like you've already mentioned, inviting him as an example to speak in chapel. And so for the 40,000 SBC theological students to see Ed Litton on display as a model pastor, here's what you can get away with, and here's what we want to endorse. It's gross. And shameful. when I talk, it's shameful. And when I talk to very elite pastors, they give him cover. Yeah. When I talk to pastors who can make a difference, they speak highly of him. I'm, I'm floored. And when I ask about these things, it's like they just slide right around it and they continue with a positive glazed over approach. And Proverbs 28, 13 says, one, one who conceals his sins will not prosper. So I, I just want nothing to do with this. Right. It has literally been rottenness to my bones to think through these yeah. things. It's been heart wrenching. And by the way, as a side note, when I spoke with Dr. Hicks, whom I followed, he um, was highly involved in the convention, especially our state convention. And, um, and he asked the right questions. He's getting older now and, and I try not to share too much with him because I don't want his heart to ache at his age. No. He knows the right questions to ask. And so I give him the answers and um, he wept. He just absolutely wept over the phone. And he said, Casey, my beloved convention, whom I've loved my entire career is no more. And through his tears, he said, I, too, if I were in your shoes, would be doing the same thing. Yeah. He stands for righteousness and is not tolerating all of this wickedness. Yeah. And some time ago, our church drew a line in the sand. And that is where God's line in the sand is. And that's homosexuality. We, we decided as a church that when nothing is being done about homosexuality, we're out. And so now we've had James Merritt tweet an approval of his homosexual son's sermon and say that it was faithful to the gospel. Yeah. And not to, not to interrupt you, but since you brought him up, he has a, uh, he had a tweet right at, I think it was the last day of the convention. I think it was, I'll, I'll put it up and post it. And he said, there is no doctrinal drift in the SBC, none. Ignore anyone who says otherwise. No doctrinal drift in the SBC. This coming from the man who, in, as you just said, endorsed a sermon preached by his son, who is a homosexual, as being faithful to the gospel. And I've mm -hmm. listened to that sermon painfully three times because I did a video. There's not the faintest hint of the gospel anywhere in that sermon. Right. But there's no doctrinal drift in the SBC. Trust us. Yeah. Unbelievable. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're exactly right. And this is going to lead up to the, the bombshell that you shared with me. So now you have James Merritt, a prior SBC president and still a predominant pastor in the SBC. J.D. Greer saying homosexuality will not send you to hell. Ed Litton saying homosexuality will not send, to hell, send you to hell. And now, Bart Barber. I know. The new president. And I'm, yeah. yeah, I'm absolutely floored. And you discovered that he said that when eight years ago, yes, 2014. Do you have those in front of you there by chance? Yeah, yeah. So his tweets, you know, I just I don't have these in order here. And um, so I doubt anyone at the ERLC believes that all non-celibate gay people endure an eternity in hell. Um, I don't get it. Self-avowed practicing homosexuals can be saved without repenting. What's the point of the ERLC? Uh, let's see. Jacob, repenting does not equal perfect. I repent of getting angry. So here's a conflation between getting angry and being a homosexual. I repent of getting angry. Um, I wind up getting angry again, but I'm not going to hell for that. 
homosexuality uh, practice is a sin. I believe that arrogance is a sin. So there again, the conflating between arrogance and homosexuality is just a downplaying of homosexuality. And here it is. I believe that, but uh, being a serial boaster is not enough to send you to hell apart from the gospel. But if you've been saved by grace, serial boasting will not send you to hell, nor will sexual sin, including homosexuality. Yeah. So to say that homosexuality will not send you to hell is just contrary to the plain scriptures. I mean, it doesn't even take observation, interpretation, and application to figure that out. Right. Right. So, yeah. First, first Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 is not unclear. It, it's mm-hmm. not unclear. So, yeah. So the, the previous two presidents of SBC, the newly elected current president of the SBC, and I went to seminary with Bart. I, uh, he was a couple of years ahead of me, but um, I, yeah, I'm, I was, I was quite honestly stunned when I saw that. You know, to bring these things up, um, I want to be very careful. Um, you know, there's there's these allegations going around of angry Baptists or, or crazy uh-huh. uncles and like that. Yeah. Th- that is um, so far away from who I am. My predisposition is joy. Um, I'm a happy-go-lucky guy. I, I love my calling. I love my life. Uh, I love my family. I love my church. And, um, and so I am generally a very happy guy. And, um, right now I'm not angry. I'm hurt. Yeah. I've got a life. I'm invested in this. I see the truth clearly and nobody who is in a position to do something about it is salvaging the Southern Baptist convention. In fact, all of this is going in a sinful direction. It breaks my heart. And when I have conversation after conversation after conversation that continuously goes down the moderate or appeasing direction or just stick it out case, it'll be all right, you know, and glazing over these facts that are just rooted in sin spreads like gangrene and never stop. And if we don't address these things and bring it to a repentance and root it out, it's just going to continue to get worse and worse and worse. So there's nothing about me that's angry except for the broken hearted, not, not except if here's where it is. I'm just broken hearted in that I don't see the right pastors doing the right things. Now I have had a ton of pastors come and say, you, you guys are really getting the truth out. It took a lot of courage to do that. And let me tell you, I appreciate it. And so there's a lot who shake my hand. There's a lot of good pastors who are saying we need more of this truth out there because this is what's going to help the people in the pews. It's going to help the churches. Yeah. So nevertheless, I'm a believer in the truth and won't compromise or shrink back from it. Right. Right. And as David said in the Psalms, uh, Psalm 119, 104, from your precepts, I get perception therefore i hate every false way in other words so from your word i get perception understanding therefore i hate every false way so the only reason we hate sin hate error as christians is because we love the truth and if you love the truth therefore you hate what is error but you and i casey we've talked a lot people have heard us on these videos you and i talked a lot behind the scenes we have nothing but love for homosexuals and mm-hmm. we, it's just that we love them enough to tell them the truth. Right. We love them enough to tell them the truth. We love them enough to tell them there is freedom in the gospel. But if you're still in that sin, scripture could not be more clear. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. Yeah. Um, so it, it, the only hatred is those is coming from those who know the truth but won't tell them that's hatred. Yeah, it, it sure is. And, and we have it in the highest positions uh, right now in the SBC. Okay. And so along with 
that being the line in the sand that God draws. Obviously, there's no other reason why God rained down, you know, hail, fire, and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah other than for homosexuality, that mm-hmm. sin. And then in Romans 1, where the mind is turned over to a depraved mind, God t- doesn't turn one's over to a depraved mind for anything else other than that sin. So that seems to be clear. It's God's line in the sand. And so we as a church decided that's our line in the sand as well. And as we went to the convention, that was not even brought up. Mm. I mean, completely swept underneath the rug. And now you've got another president who clearly for a long time has believed the same. You can only expect for it to continue to spread and get worse. So nevertheless, uh, the writing is on the wall. And when I see Ed Litton not only um, peddling these things, but also bringing in Tony Evans, um, who, you know, is woke. He's espousing yeah. this um, KRT, Kingdom Race Theory. And anyone out there that wants to Google Kingdom Race Theory and Tony Evans, you can see the videos for yourself. I warn you, though, it's very uh, slick. If, if you are an average Christian and you do not know how to do inductive Bible study, you will hear scriptures quoted well, but out of context. Yeah. You will hear passages of scripture that sound very appealing to the aura of the world today and put in a context to where you're like, wow, I get it. And he is leading people to being woke very, very convincingly. So never, he basically espouses the fact that critical race theory is addressing the, the racism in the fabric of America, in the systems, in the economic systems, in the political systems, in all of the structures. So he takes critical race theory and he clearly says that is a Marxist philosophy. And he takes that and he says, in our day, we've added the BLM movement and organization to it. But he differentiates between the Black Lives Matter movement and the Black Lives Matter organization. He says the organization, and he's right, that is against the nuclear family and for LGBTQ. So he separates that from the Black Lives Matter movement and says, we need the movement. We need folks to know that Black Lives Matter. And he conflates that with Anglo or whites or conservatives who say unborn babies' lives matter. Yeah. So very convincing in how he lumps these things together. And then he brings in the 1619 Project and says that America wasn't founded in 1776. It was founded in 1619. And the reason America was founded was so that white people can get wealthy off the backs of the slaves. That's how America was established. That's why that is the definition of America. And so the laws that were made to protect those who were getting wealthy were made at the expense of black people. So the very fabric and everything in America is woke. And what that logically leads to is the evil left political's agenda to completely crush and annihilate and destroy America and rebuild it in a communist way. This gets real, real fast. And he substantiates using a Marxist theory to prove his point. And then he adds it to the gospel and he misrepresents Galatians chapter two. I'm floored at how well he's able to say it in a convincing way, but it is so wrong. So he says that Paul did racial reconciliation to the racist Peter in Galatians chapter two, verses 11 and following. And in, in Galatians 2, 11 and following, Paul condemns Peter for his racism against the Gentiles, and he says to him, you are not acting in concert with the truth of the gospel. And it is not about 
racial reconciliation. No. I'm I'm for look. Galatians chapter two and verse five is saying that it's the truth of the gospel. That's the context of this passage. Galatians chapter two and verse 14 about the truth of the gospel. So the essence here is that Peter was shrinking back from the newly converted Gentiles and gravitating to the Judaizers. And in doing so, his association with them was saying to the Gentiles that we need to add the law to the gospel. And so therefore, Paul noticed that the gospel is compromised here in their mind. Peter, don't shrink back. This is not good. And so Paul corrected him. That's the context here. It's so easy to read that. Absolutely. Yeah. Galatians is, this is, it's not about it, it doesn't have anything to do with race, for one thing. I mean, uh, and to quote uh, Daryl Harrison and Virgil Walker, you know, they say races don't reconcile. Hearts reconcile. We're, we're reconciled to the gospel. That's the reconciliation. We're, we're reconciled to God, I should say, to God through the gospel. But there's only one race anyway. There, right. There's only yeah. one race. There aren't many races. There's, there's one race, one. That's it. So this was a yeah. theological issue. This was a gospel issue in Galatians, not an, it was not about re- quote unquote race. Yeah. And to continue on this thread, you would take and say, okay, well, average Christians could easily be fooled by this because it seems right on the surface. The scripture sounds good. You're loving your brethren. You want everybody to be unified is the the claim this is what's being set forward however a worldly marxist theory cannot be mixed with scripture to guide our lives right right it's never going to end up right never ever 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 and this gets to the sufficiency of scripture that the sbc is completely abandoned yes exactly and that when you're talking about not only Galatians chapter two being misinterpreted, but the whole book of Philemon and the purpose of that was not for the right. abolition of slavery. Right. No. So nevertheless, you, they missed the theme there. And I hope that your average Christian would just sit back and be a good Berean believer. Take what's being said and bring it home and compare it to the scriptures and read them for yourself and do inductive Bible study and study for yourself and rightly divide it. Now, not only do our SBC elites espouse all of this, but underneath the leadership of Kevin Ezell at the North American Mission Board, you have send material that now includes the critical race theory and intersectionality content. Most notably, it is known as the great requirement. So the great requirement is what they're calling it. And that has been added to the great commission. And so um, Mr. Lewis here himself is a social justice warrior and he espouses the great requirement. And it includes social justice and economic justice in our efforts to evangelize and plant churches. So now you ask, why are you leaving Casey? Well. Our very church planting network is compromised in how we share the gospel. And they say that our Southern Baptist Convention, well, the Southern Baptist Convention, no longer saying our, is going to be mostly made of church plants in the near future. And if this is the case, you got to be kidding me. Well, NAM has $70 million in the district. It's enormous how much money is going towards this agenda. So that is the case. And then you have gross expenditures, such as $3 million was purchased for just a few homes for a handful of church planters. It doesn't make any sense. So nevertheless, there's an unnamed amount of money in the cooperative funds and These funds have been used to purchase homes in Chicago and these homes, you know, what are they used for? Well, I don't know why NAM is invested in real estate and doing all of these things, 
But, you know, the case is it's unaccountable. The messengers can't figure out what's going on. And when you ask Kevin Ezell himself, he just simply ignores the question and goes to, well, he, we here at the North American Mission Board, we're about to planting churches and sharing the gospel and helping people. And, and it goes through all of this and ignores the question. Wow. That is shameful. That is shameful. So completely pulling the wool over the eyes of, of all the people that have given their money to this. And there's, there's, you know, where, where's the accountability? Where's. So. Yeah. That being the case. So now you look at the messengers on the floor and you say, okay, wow, they are overwhelmingly approving of lying Lytton and they're no. overwhelmed approving of Tony Evans in this initiative where we came back and on every single chair, there was this urban initiative where Lytton is leading our convention and our people and our churches into partnering with Tony Evans in this urban initiative. So this urban initiative is to rebuild communities. It's going down the woke path. And yeah. you're I'm like, so a lot of our churches are going to send volunteers, untold amount of volunteer hours to partner with the worldly initiative. Now, I'm just flabbergasted at this. And in the midst of it all, um, Lytton plays a personal video for the messengers, which was completely woke. And it used an older white man to confess that he was a racist. And there are many reasons it should not be working. But God is moving. Would you please look to the screens? Mobile, Alabama is steeped in history. Yet not everything that happens makes it into the history books at first. We are a city of secrets. Open and well-known secrets that many refuse to face. We are a city of wounds. Still open and festering. We are the city where the last slave ship offloaded its cargo of stolen lives. We are the city where Michael Donald, a black man, was lynched in 1981. These deep wounds, these shameful legacies have hung over our city like a toxic cloud. But God stirred. I grew up in a very segregated mobile back in the 50s. Growing up in the South, uh, as I have, I convinced myself that there wasn't a racial bond in my body. But I came to realize that that was a lie. And he didn't know it, but now he knows that he's a racist. And it, it was a, right there in front of the world to be able to see 10,000 plus messengers in one room watched this woke video. And I don't see any pushback. I don't see any clarity. I, anybody calling for I was right beside of uh, Steve Gaines uh, there, and I was talking with him. And at the time, the question of um, the definition of a pastor was brought up and he looked over at me and he said, you know, I was on the committee that revised the Baptist faith and message 2000. We all knew what a pastor was. It's given. It's a man. We don't need a definition or a committee or a study committee or yeah. we need all of this. Yeah. And I totally agreed. Um, it's shameful that um, we have a woman at the chair of the committee who is trying to tell pastors what a pastor is and no. delaying all of this. this I did not coming, admit Yeah, this is coming from the credentials committee. This was something that came out of the credentials committee, as you said, is led by a woman, and they proposed to take a year to study what a pastor is. The Southern Baptist Convention is, is what, 167 years old, I think, if I'm doing my math right? 167 years old, and you don't know what a pastor is? Lord, have mercy. Yeah, well, we, the, the Southern Baptist Convention was established in 1845. There's nearly 50,000 churches and nearly 14 million members. And we've got that nailed down. And that was, you know, rather um, hilarious 
to see that, but everyone knew that it was simply a liberal-like move, a moderate move to perhaps delay and exhaust the conser- the real conservatives so yeah. that perhaps a redefined pastorate can enable women to teach when first Timothy, you know, clearly says in two twelve, I do not permit a woman to have authority or to teach over a man or to teach or have authority over a man. Yeah. And so you see this happening. Um, I was talking to a pastor this morning and he and his church uh, saw our first video and um, it went viral in their church their deacons are unanimous, and now he's meeting with each committee, Sunday school classes and everything. It's it's a rather large First Baptist Church, and they so far are unanimous in moving away from all of this stuff somehow, separating from the convention. And, um, you know, it takes a long time to keep a church in unity and to talk with everyone and to hear from everyone and to explain everything. It's just, I mean, we're going to chew up a lot of time just in this, and we're only going to be touching the tips of the iceberg. Yeah. So it never it takes a while. But uh, he said to me this morning, it seems like the Southern Baptist Convention, by and large, is made up of beta males and not alpha males. And the complacency from those who are not assertive. We, we need more alpha males who are assertive. But, but here's the facts. As you look through the culture of the SBC and its pragmatism and taking on the ways of the world, the feminist movement has pushed really hard to soften the men. And they have not yeah. embraced male leadership, even down to the home and the marriage. Everything yeah. has been inverted and simply taken second seat. So men, by and large, have become very passive. And the old adage that, you know, every pastor, you know, has heard, if you want to get something done, get a woman after it and such. But nevertheless, yeah. that being the case, but it comes to, it's a cultural aspect of the Southern Baptist Convention that um, is not going away. The Feminist movement is rooted in the Southern Baptist Convention. NAM is planting churches with women pastors co-pastoring. First Baptist Orlando has women preaching regularly. Their church plants have women preaching regularly. Nobody's correcting them. Rick Warren ordained women. It, the, the, the list just kind of goes on and on and on. And when this starts to happen, it's the same thing with the doctrine of God. You're bringing down the view of God and you're lifting up a view of yourself and you're bringing down roles and you're lifting up yourself. Yeah. So, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And it's, uh, I've, I've seen, um, I've, I can't remember where it is, but anyway, there's a list of, um, of Southern Baptist churches complete with pictures and screenshots of their web pages of of a lot i don't remember how many it is but it's but it's in the it's in the hundreds of southern baptist churches who have women pastors now they may not be the quote unquote senior pastor but it's like you know pastor of children pastor of whatever you know fill in the blank there's a lot of them there's Mm -hmm. a lot of them you know and and they in the you know, to try to tease out the different, the, the, the function from the office, that's garbage. That's absolutely yeah. garbage. Yeah. The gift of the pastoring versus the office and the dicing it up and, yeah. you know. No, no, so absolutely. That's not. one thing that Al Mohler said correctly. If we have to have a search committee on a word, then we're doomed as a convention, which it's already, but, you know. Yeah. I mean, Leading from behind, but but whatever. Okay. <laughs> One other area that I have gradually been completely um, and and now vehemently against in the culture of the Southern Baptist Convention is in the area of the doctrine of soteriology. Mm-hmm. So, easy believism is a major part in getting the numbers and getting the salvations and the baptisms and the attenders, easy believism through just raise your hand or say this prayer yep. is 
creating more false converts who profess to be Christians, but do not possess the Holy Spirit because their lifestyle denies it. And in John chapter three and verse 36, it's very clear that we cannot just believe that Jesus is Lord. By the way, in the book of James, the thing it's 2.11 or 2.19, even the demons believe. Yeah, but sorry. in John 36, not only are we called to believe, but obey, lest the wrath of God be upon us. Yeah. So obedience is key, and you can tell them by their fruits, right? You just simply look at someone's life, and it tells you. So I'm, I'm so disheartened at how we project, or they in the Southern Baptist Convention have projected that lostness in the world is great, and they're dying because you're not going or giving enough, and we need to do more missions, and we need to do all of this. And so thousands are dying every single day, is what Paul Chitwood said, and they're going to hell. And I appreciate his passion. However, it's misplaced because now it's as if God needs us in order to achieve his remnant, in order to achieve the salvation that he's given. And John 3, 37 and many other are very, very clear. All those that the Father gives me will come to me. Yeah, that's right. And so when you reduce God and you elevate us, it's a low view of God and it's an erroneous view of soteriology. Yeah. And I cannot sit and stomach this anymore. And when, I mean, I've, I've been, you know, I started at Fruitland Baptist Bible College in Hendersonville, North Carolina, got an associates in preaching. And um, that was my first degree. EE was one of the classes, evangelism explosion. We were expected to go out and, you know, get five converts a week or something like that, you know, and, and I felt so <laughs> uncomfortable with going out and strong helping someone through that presentation. And, 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 and I just took less of a grade in that class. I was very uncomfortable with it. Now I see it doctrinally as to yeah. why that sharing the gospel is right, but it's the power of the gospel and the salvation, it, not our articulate view of theology, not our winsomeness, not our That's guilt right. trip, not our heart tugs, not our yeah. stories. And we should be sharing truth. And sharing the need to repent until the Holy Spirit of God comes and convicts that soul and they fall underneath conviction. And they are now feeling sorrowful, which leads to repentance unto salvation. Second yeah. Corinthians 7.10 clearly lays out the domino effect of how true salvation really happens. But when we skip repentance and we skip the Holy Spirit's role in convicting the heart and the soul, and we jump in front of him and we affirm them that they're saved by saying a prayer. It means yeah. you and I both know that if you could say a prayer, then you can unsay a prayer. You, you can't save yourself by saying anything. That would be equated to a work. It's not by works, lest any man should boast. Right. So now I'm wrapped around all of this easy believism. And to try and correct this culture seems insurmountable. The only way truly to take a stand is to separate myself now yeah. to be able to speak clearly, to be separate. Second Corinthians six seventeen says, therefore come out from among their midst and be separate. Yeah. Yeah. Amen, brother. I, I think it has gotten to that point. In fact, I, I would say, uh, it, it's, it's been pretty clear, I think, for several years now that it's gotten to that point. Going back to, I think it was 2019, that uh, resolution, was it resolution nine? Is that what it was? Resolution nine, the adoption of CRT as a useful analytical tool. And the argument can be made, okay, yeah, they adopted that at the convention in 2019. Critical race theory is a useful analytical tool. But, you know, three years ago, not everybody knew what social justice was. They didn't know what CRT was. Well, mm -hmm. then you had the convention last year, 2021. People knew what it was then. We had the statement on social justice and the gospel. Even if you didn't hear about CRT in your church, almost every Southern Baptist watches Fox News. You know what CRT and social justice is just from watching Tucker Carlson, you know, and 
so the conservatives last year in 21, they really tried to marshal all their forces and they're going to take back the convention. Uh, but Mike Stone, the conservative, lost to the <laughs> serial plagiarist and liar Ed Litton. But it was close. It was a close vote last year. This year in Anaheim, okay, the conservatives really ramping up now. They threw everything and the kitchen sink mm -hmm. at the convention this year in 22. And they yeah. even got an endorsement. I say they, Tom Askell, who I love, I have a world of respect for Tom Askell. Um, you know, he was the conservative candidate going against Bart Barber. And a couple other guys. Um, Jack Graham, pastor of Prestonwood Baptist Church, one of the largest Baptist churches in the SBC, massive church in Dallas. He came out before the convention and he endorsed, to my surprise, Tom Askell. And, uh, and I say to my surprise because Jack Graham is not soteriologically reformed. He's not in that, in that camp with you and me and with Tom Askell at all. He's right. Armenian, so yeah. he's no expositor at all. Um, the last person I saw him endorse was Paula White, but that's another conversation. So, but when he came out and endorsed Tom Askell, I thought, you know, maybe that's going to carry enough weight and that's going to bring enough votes uh, towards Tom Askell because, you know, here's an Armenian more of a typical SBC guy, and he's endorsing Tom Askell. Well, they had the vote, and it wasn't even close. Yeah. Last year's was close. This wasn't even, this was a blowout. This was a landslide. Tom lost by like 21 percentage points. It <laughs> wasn't even close. And so, like, what, how, how many more years, how many more, how many more conventions do you need to realize there's no, and even if Tom had won, it wouldn't have changed anything. But yeah. it would blow out. And I was saddened because we have a good man, Pastor Tom Askall and Vody Bauckham, who were willing to really work hard at changing the direction of the Southern Baptist Convention. And we're a part of the Conservative Baptist Network. And like you said, they pulled no stops. If, if yeah. anything... Happened. It was going to be pulled together this year yeah. and the momentum and everything, even though it was in Anaheim and um, John MacArthur came to yeah. the conservative network uh, meeting and spoke. You know, it was just phenomenal. So nevertheless, um, with everything that we can possibly pull together, like you mentioned in 2019, there was a Dallas statement that was ignored in 2019. SBC voted in critical race theory. Yeah. Nothing's been done about it. There's this huge cry for unity. Yeah. Have critical race theory cemented in. And now it's in our seminaries. Yeah. And That's I've right. got tech from our theological students who are sitting underneath this garbage. And I'm telling you, like Al Mohler has dubbed racism as a stain. Now his imagery is powerful here, right? So he says the stain of racism has a coined term by him. So Mohler believes that racism will be dominant in our society until the coming of Christ. Now um, that is a narrative that, will be being chased forever. Yep. It's a thing that's not going to go away. That's what he's saying. So he has appointed um, three progressive professors to promote and teach critical race theory, Jarvis Williams, Matt Hall, and Curtis Woods. And he fired four conservative professors and used COVID as an excuse to do that. And that was, yeah. Yeah. well... Yeah. And then forced them, tried to force them all to sign a non-disclosure, which is unethical. They've already put in their time. They deserve their pensions. They deserve, you know, the money, the severance package. But to pit them against not saying anything negative about the seminary in any way against their retirement and their package is just simply unethical. It has no 
being no place in Christian life. Yeah. But not only that, I mean, Matt Hall, he claims to be a racist and he openly does this on video. Look it up. And so right. he's teaching logical students. If you're white, repent. Yeah. If you're a racist. Yeah, I, I know. And, and it's, but this is the, this is the social justice game. This is the CRT. This is the internet inter, intersectionality game. You're, of course, if you admit you're a racist, obviously you're racist because you just admitted to it. But if you, if you say, no, I'm not a racist. Ah, see the very fact that you don't know you're a racist proves your racism. Right. So it's this never ending hamster wheel of, of, victimhood and grievances and all that good that's the the end game is that there is no end game right yeah the end game and is that there is no end game you're Sorry. exactly right. and to circle back around to what tony evans espouses in his whole slick spiel let me tell you it is a very subtle subvertive move in that it's convincing people that their identity and their value is found from this worldly philosophy and theory added to and mixed in with scripture. And you, through a, a woke narrative and racial reconciliation, will be validified. You, you will establish your value here. Yeah. Instead, like we've already said, there's only one race, your, your identity and your value, and not everything is in Christ and in Christ alone. Yeah. And so when, when, when you have truly uh, one who is as well known and respected as Tony Evans coming in and doing all this and saying it so well, he really believes this, but I'm floored at how it's an abandonment of the basic scriptures, especially our um, convictions of the scriptures and in Christ alone. But nevertheless, um, I hope that um, we're able to enable people to be able to see that. But as well, over back with the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, Jarvis Williams, teaching Black liberation theology in the classroom. Yeah. You can get this. There's videos of this. It's found online. It's promoting intersectionalities, promoting all this. He co-authored Removing the Stain of Racism with Kevin Jones. Jonathan Pennington, a professor who openly ascribes to some type of Gadamerian hermeneutic. And basically all that is, is saying that your prejustice or your thought assumptions, your traditions are part of who you are and it taints your interpretation of scripture. And so you cannot find a pure exegesis. You're nevertheless, it's just way off. It's yeah. a postmodern thing that enables truth to be relative. So it's denying the true meaning derived derived from the text. When we see that we can study a text and by the help of the Holy Spirit, according to John 14, 26, the helper helps us to know truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is true. But here, this hermeneutic says, nope, the Holy Spirit cannot help you know truth because you're tainted. Yes. The Holy Spirit's just not strong enough on his own. He's just not strong enough. It, what an insult to the Holy Spirit of God. What an insult to God, to his word, to his Holy Spirit, to the power of the gospel. You know, by God's grace, and some people watching this have heard me say this, Casey, by God's grace, I've been all over the world. I have I have preached in now, I think, 28 different countries all over the world. And when I'm with like-minded believers, there is an instant bond, an instant love, fellowship, kindred spirit with these people. It doesn't matter how much they have or how little they have. It doesn't matter if I'm in a village in, in Uganda, Africa, people living in grass huts, or if I'm in a European country, or if I'm in Brazil or Ecuador or the Philippines, it doesn't matter. You know, I don't, I don't care how much melanin they have in their skin. They don't care how little I may have in mine. There's an instant love there because we recognize each other's, each other as family. 
we're family. We're, we're brothers. We're sisters in Christ. We have been adopted into the family of God through the merits of his son, Jesus. And melanin levels don't matter. And so the social justice, CRT, all this, it is trying to build up walls mm-hmm. that the gospel is already crushed, right. ground to powder. And it's trying to build these things up again. And it's just, it is, yeah, I'm sorry. I got on my soapbox a little bit. But. It's, a, it's the same soapbox that I'm on Sunday. I mentioned another reason why I just simply cannot be a part of this anymore. It's because it's making racial relations worse. Yes, Far worse. Far worse. So I can't can't even be associated. I, I cannot be guilty by association. Yes. With it. When 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 our beloved black community realizes that welfare is not best for them, right? And the same thing with any community. When when they realize that they're being used, the color of their skin yeah. is being used. Yeah. And they realize that this victimhood mentality is juxtaposed to the sufficiency and the sovereignty of God. You know, I had the privilege, I was um, eating dinner the other day, and man, there was a whole table of black guys behind me, older guys, and man, they were really having a good time. And I enjoyed eavesdropping and hearing what they had to say. Um, It went to um, how slavery was so evil. And then one of the guys said, yeah, but you know what? God is bigger than that. And he used that to help us not to harm us. Look at the story of Joseph and how much stronger we are because of it. Yeah. And I was, I wanted to say amen, you know, <laughs> but God, when we as Christians view the hardships in our life as being a trial that God has yeah. allowed to happen by his sovereign grace, to help us not to harm us, James chapter one, verses two and following. Yep. If we, when we believe God is in control, then we know that God is developing and refining us to maturity. And we do not second guess his goodness. But when you abandon a good theological framework and you go over to this worldly philosophy and embrace a victimhood mentality, It is completely against scripture. It's downplaying the sovereignty of God. It's saying, God, I doubt what you're doing in my life. And I need somebody else to verify, to validify and to help. I need somebody else to help get me wealth or rich or, uh, or all these types of things. I absolutely hate that it's been made predominantly a a black and white thing because it's not, it's just simply all different. I mean, you look at the Indians, you look at the Asians, you'll everybody, you know, yeah. has been enslaved at one point in time. You look at Israel. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to slavery, we've got a large <laughs> portion of, our, you know, that speak to that. Yeah. But look, how used the Exodus. And so nevertheless, if God is for you. Who can be against you? We don't have to worry about this type of stuff. And one of the biggest beefs that I have about the book of Philemon being taken out of context is because the book of Colossians instructs slaves to be good and to their owners. Mm -hmm. And so a quick word study on slave, if um, you're in any question in this and, and just see what the scriptures have to say about that. And so Paul in prison in Rome wrote all the prison epistles, Philemon being one of them and Colossians being another one of them. And you cannot have two scriptures contradicting and it be true. So scripture uh, contradicts scripture is not true. It is coherent there in an alignment. So nevertheless, that's my plea to be able to just do good basic hermeneutics to find out what the themes and the truths are in the passages. So this is polluting everything when it comes to the gospel. And so to kind of, bring all of, not all, but some of these bigger subjects, you know, to, to a head here for decades, easy believism has been a cultural norm in the SBC and just raise your hand or say this prayer, VBS is all that type of stuff. Absolutely. And that is just something that I cannot deal with. Secondly, now 
we're adding and even polluting it more with critical race theory and social justice and adding that to the gospel. That is the great requirement. That's the full gospel that's being spread. It's in the seminaries and a lot of your elites are saying these things. And so when David Platt tells white people to repent and you got to do social justice to preach the full gospel or whatnot, and the list goes on and on and on. And Matt Chandler and all of Nine Marks and how woke it truly is. And now it's embedded in all of the seminary. Southeastern with Danny Aiken as president promotes a postmodern standpoint in epistemology. And, and, and having women as in pastoral studies. Yeah. awarding pastoral study degrees to women. Uh, yeah. It, it's a sad state of affairs, brother. I mean, there's no, as I was hinting at a few minutes ago, even if Tom had one and Tom's a great guy, but even if he had one, he's one man and one man is not he's, He, as much as I love Tom, he can't change hearts. He can't, right. he can't change the hearts of any of the, powers that be in the SBC, this entrenched wokeism and social justice and, and drift and all that. He can't change anybody's heart. Um, right. he, he can't change the hearts of the seminary presidents who are inviting, who are inviting Ed Litton to come in and preach in their chapel. Uh, it's just, and I'm going to say this, I'm going to say this carefully. I'm glad Tom lost. Yeah. I'm glad Tom lost, not because anything against Tom at all, but my fear was that if he had won, it would have just kicked the can down the road and, and given false hope for the SBC where there really is no hope, you know, putting perfume on a, on a corpse. Um, so it would have just delayed the inevitable. So it's just, it's clear now. I think it's clear now. I had lunch yesterday with a pastor of a small church here in Montana. He, he's become a, a good friend of mine. And um, he went to the convention. Um, he was there. And this was kind of his last gasp effort of seeing some reason to stay in the SBC. But he came back and he told me at lunch, he said, he, they're gone. They're, there's just, he said, he, he cannot, he can't justify staying in the convention any longer after what he saw in Anaheim. And he said, honestly, he said, I think at this point, it's so bad. It's so clear at this point, his words, not mine. Although I agree with him. He said to be associated with the SBC at this point is a sin issue. Wow. Well, you know, you, you are responsible for, who you hang around bad company corrupts good character and that's for everybody and when we hang around attractional worship that is not worship yeah Jesus needs nothing else but his name proclaimed to attract lostness unto him but when we try and add something to it and make these attractional worship services going to rub off on you if you're around it and easy yeah, well. to believe it when you have the goal as like what rick warren's speech was as the goal here's what happens i can't tell you it's heartbreaking when i, I i've got a, a pastor who's a friend of mine and i've asked him how are you doing what's up how are you doing and he refers to numbers from sunday offering is it up attendance is up. I'm doing good offering, you know, and he quotes the numbers and the next week or so goes by. I said, how are you doing? 
and offering is down, attendance is down, he's down. And so the pastor being directly connected to numbers, it's an idol issue. It's a heart issue. It's a cultural issue. It's, it's what has been being happening in the Southern Baptist Convention for a long time. And David in the Bible got in the worst trouble for using numbers the wrong way. You know, pastors yeah. are shepherding the flock and preaching the word and for prayer. And those are our goals. And we should just simply do those things very, very well. We should lead our churches well and be sufficient in the obedience and in the journey and let God have all of the glory, whether the church grows numerically or he refines the churches to his glory. We're simply to focus on the soul, develop the heart and the mind for Christ and love on the sheep and evangelize and disciple. These faithfulnesses are where we should be. Now, um, as we start to land this plane, I'd like to rattle off a, a few things to kind of conclude as to a lot of the reasons why I'm wiping my hands and I'm walking away and no longer I'm going to be a Southern Baptist pastor. Um, we've talked about the easy believism for numbers. Um, we've talked about the attractional worship services. I see by and large where pastoral friendships are put over the scriptures. And so sin is not being addressed and pastors side with pastors and friendship. And you bring something up and say, we need to help this brother or whatnot, or we need to address this. Oh, well, I know I've known him for 10 years. So I was speaking with the pastor of First Baptist Naples, a new pastor down there, and mentioned First Baptist Orlando is got these issues that are going on. Yeah. And he wanted nothing to do with it. He said, well, you know, I, I know David Youth. And brother, it gets, you know, moderately worse and worse and worse. Alan Brumbach just simply defended his friendship with David Youth instead of, and, and the conversation was very neutral. It's not like I'm headhunting. I'm like, you know, you are now a pastor of a predominant church who would have a voice with David. And um, I'm, I'm going to open up and share some things with you here. Perhaps you can give him a call then and talk with him. And he wanted nothing to do with it. So his friendship with David is more important to him than scriptural clarity and convictions and God. And nothing is going to get between me and my obedience to this to scripture and no friendship. So nevertheless, friendship by and large trump the scriptures. Yep. And yep. that is a cultural issue, the 11th commandment, so to speak, in the SBC. Yeah. You know, there's a, um, a lot who are not absolutely against abortion. I can't side at all with that. Uh, yeah. There's a lot for women preachers. Um, they are okay with millions of dollars being hidden. Um, they're okay with racial issues being made worse. Um, they're okay with messengers being ignored rudely. This happened, there was abuse in this article, abuse that happened to my wife in her childhood. It was sent to Baptist News Global as a means of retaliation for me having reported this. Bob gossip began to spread that I was acting politically. Everything I feared would happen did. I contacted the task force, or at Mr. least Buck, the consultant Mr. did. Buck, excuse me, but you cannot make personal accusations on the floor of this convention. What accusation did I make? And I made, I, I pardon, what, what specifically did I say? We, we, we must maintain order in the room. This is not how we do our business. So let us continue with this. Mr. Buck, it, it appeared to me that you were making an accusation in your statement just previous to this. So could you if you can, you what is specific I said that was an accusation, I want to make sure I don't do that. Well, you, you made accusations about someone reporting this to a news organization and so forth. So if you would, move to your question, please. Well, that's not an accusation, Mr. President. That's actually reported by Baptist News Global. Okay. Could you move to your question, please? I am moving to my question. Thank you. And given the platform to, to Tony Evans and Rick Warren for an unlimited amount of time, we have polluted seminaries with the critical race theory now. You said you just come out of Southwestern? Yeah, I come out of Southwestern, and uh, we were taught that 
right there, you know, in systematic theology that the fire in hell was metaphorical. And I and and I was taking notes. I thought, surely I misheard. And so I raised my hand. I said, did I hear that right? That there's no fire? And I said, well, what about the weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth? I said, it's a lake of fire. There is burning. And he said, well, Chris, how is there fire if it's dark? I said, I don't know. There just is. The Bible says that there's fire in hell. And I said, hey, guys, because everyone in there is about 15 years younger than me, right? You know, I'm 38 years old. And I said, look, y'all know that feeling you have in your heart? Like yeah. something just doesn't feel right about what you just heard? I said, that's the Holy Spirit telling you what you heard was a damnable heresy. Right. Because there is fire in hell. Right. So, and I've got hours and hours and hours. I've recorded every lecture while I was at Southwestern. Let me tell you what's being taught. Yeah. This, uh, oh, what would you call it? Like, we all just need to unify. Okay. We all just need to find common ground and find find the common ground, whether they be Muslim, whatever. Let's find that common ground so we can save Christianity. Right. And it's pragmatism. Yeah, right. That's it. It's pragmatism. And, and I challenge anyone who thinks that I'm lying because I've got hours and hours and hours of all my lectures. So You're kidding. Anything on social justice at Southwestern? <laughs> yeah. Really? It's, yeah. Critical it's, race theory? It's, it's, it's horrible. Tons of woke initiatives. I didn't mention before, but the SIN Network, I was concerned now underneath the leadership of uh, Bryant Wright as hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars going towards what looks like to me more of a Catholic humanitarian effort with little gospel. And if it is the gospel being shared, it is what we just talked about, a woke gospel rather or yeah. easy belief at best. And so when you're adding um, this cultural shift for a humanitarian effort, when there's a disaster to go and help. Now, we need to help, especially those who are in need. But anybody can help. The primary thing that we should be doing is meeting a need to share Christ and spending time with them with doing the true gospel. So nevertheless, um, it can't be a part of millions of dollars going in a humanitarian effort through the sin network, which they would brag and say that a hundred percent of our giving goes straight towards the sin network. And it gets right in there without any, you know, staff or building costs or, or whatever. But if it's woke and if it's off, then none of your money is doing well. So I believe that the best way to deal with that is just to pull out to make our voices heard that way. And, um, and perhaps others would see it the same way. If that's what they want to do, that's fine. Yeah. But I can't talk about initiatives. I can't tolerate, you know, our seminaries are now going to be producing church plants and missionaries that have this polluted gospel. You know, James 127 says that pure and undefiled religion is to keep yourself unspotted from the world at the end of that verse. So, yeah. Can't. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to do you want to give just a very cliff note review of what you told me this morning about the interesting uh, guest you had uh, at, the, at the meeting who walked in? Not really, but yes. I mean, <laughs> that was so surprising. As um, so, I get get invited personally by a friend to um, a meeting with pastors to have a a, a a prayer conference, and so it's a, a meeting for pastors on prayer, and uh, and it's mostly us Southern Baptist pastors here in Central Florida, you know, that were invited. And, um, and so I, it was a couple months ago, I got the invite. So the RSVP and went and, uh, man, it was done well at, um, uh -huh. man, Hill golf club and the best breakfast and they flew in. I don't care for the black of you know, Henry yeah. black of is all that kind of stuff, because yeah. that kind of plays the thing that we just talked about hearing from God, easy believism and all, but nevertheless, um, there's that speaker and, 
we went and my associate pastor and I, we went there. And so we're at a pastor's conference about prayer. And to my surprise, I mean, like I needed confirmation on leaving the SBC, to my surprise, Paula White walks in with her husband. <laughs> Bro. Yeah. But at a, at a, at a pastor's, pastor's yeah. meeting. Yeah. Paula White walks in. Brother, brother Paula. <laughs> <laughs> like, yikes. So um, I'm not praying with Paula. And oh, no. we we were not going there to pray. We were going there to meet and hear about, you know, a prayer conference or whatnot. It's going to be in September. And I thought to myself, if we were praying today, I would walk away from my plate and leave. There's no way I'm going to be praying with a false prophet, a fake healer. Yeah. There's just no, I'm not going to be guilty by association, but since we're sitting down and we're not going to be, you know, holding hands and singing Kumbaya or anything, I'm going to ride this meeting out. So I did. And um, later that day, I called the organizer of the meeting and said, hey, if, if you would take my name off the list, I want nothing to do with an ecumenical movement, a prayer movement here in Central Florida, a multi-denominational thing. Um, I'm all right. And um, if you'd like to talk about it, that's fine. And then called the pastor that invited me and shared the same thing. Said, you take a, my Southern name Baptist, off. a Southern Baptist pastor organized this and invited you, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's enough to seal the deal for me, brother. Yeah. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. I know as if you needed any confirmation, but that was it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, a Southern Baptist pastor asked Paula White, one of the most notorious, obvious heretics, false prophets and charlatans ever to disgrace the name of Christ. But Hey, yeah, let's invite her to come in. I mean, yeah. stunning, stunning lack of discernment. Yeah. Some, you would say that perhaps but, she was in by another pastor or whatever, but nevertheless, well, Jack nevertheless, Graham endorsed her, Jack, Jack Graham and Robert Jeffress. At first Dallas, right. Endorsed her in her book in back in 2019 called her uh, my good friend, Paula White, Jack Graham and, and Robert Jeffress both said that and endorsed her a notorious charlatan and heretic Two <laughs> pastors of two of the largest Southern Baptist churches in the entire convention. Yeah. Let's endorse Paula White. Stunning. I mean, stunning. I know. I, I live right around the corner from New Destiny and um, and see and have gone myself and seen the, the the poor folks in need being pushed to the side and the show go on and, and Paula will rear back and punch somebody in the guts and yell at the demon to be, you know, removed. It's a show. It's fake. I'm floored at how many people come. I'm shocked at the low sense of discernment and the now the association and however Southern Baptist pastors are now being associated with this multi-denominational communal movement yeah. is just further confirmation that there is a direction that the Southern Baptist Convention is going in and I'm not going in that direction. Amen. Amen. Nope. I'm so for our church and they're going to vote as to what they want to do on their own. And, um, I appreciate them. And so far everything seems in complete unity. I haven't had one person say to me that we, that they think they should say, in fact, everyone has said we can only do what's right. And this is what's right. That is evidence of a well taught and well shepherded flock brother. So Amen. thank you. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, Casey, we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, thank you. I appreciate your courage. Um, thank you to you, to your wife, your family, your, your congregation there. 
Uh, look forward to being with you in December. We have a, a yeah. conference coming up. Uh, I'll be there, Susan Heck and Phil Johnson. So yes. uh, look forward to that. And and you and I have another video that we're going to do in the next few days. And um, that's going to be dealing with First Baptist Orlando. Um, we've done a few videos already, but we're going to do another one. And uh, some have pushed back because we, we've talked about how First Baptist Orlando is baptizing homosexuals and they um, have, you know, transgendered people serving and all this kind of stuff that we've talked about. And, and we've heard from, I don't even know how many, between the two of us, dozens of, of current or former members, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, um, no I cannot say dozens. I'm, I'm over a hundred now when it comes to people who have contacted me with firsthand experiences and over long, well over a hundred well over a so yeah between emails phone calls personal visits and such and it is staggering to how much continues to stack by way of verification as to what you and I have talked about. So those who know and have experienced it have come and said, Casey, how you and Justin handled that was above reproach. You spoke well and yes to everything you said and unfortunately more. more. And so I've in my office, people come and testimonies and this is just stacking up yeah. and and we'll we'll have more of that uh, in our next video, and and we'll have we'll have the receipts. So, um, and again, you know, it's not something we take joy in. Uh, we wish it weren't the case, but people need to be aware, and um, people need to be aware, and, and they they need to be in a good church, a good church, biblically defined, biblically led, that does expositional preaching, that does church discipline, and and again, as we've said before, the most loving thing that we can do for people is to tell them the truth. And we've heard mm -hmm. from homosexuals, for, former, yeah. former, let me see. You and I have both heard from former homosexuals who have, who have thanked us, right? For. Yes. Generally said, we really appreciate the truth and the clarity, the ambiguity. It keeps them in, in sin, but yes. coming out of yes. Christ is the need. So, coming out they're vulnerable and it's something that they say that they could slip back into the lifestyle very easily but when the truth is there and they sense that we are for them not against them and so when they see that the best thing for your life and for your soul is truth then all of a sudden that light comes on and truth is truth and it does yeah. the work work so nevertheless there are a lot of people out there two things who are hurt, right? Who have, have been given to First Baptist Orlando for a long time. have lost, they feel like they've lost years and years and years of their life. They've been yeah, yeah. fooled yeah. and lied to, they've been taken advantage of, they've given to these things and they, and they, they're just hurt. And conversations have been had with Danny and David and they've been walked away from, but that, and then yeah, as well, there are still people out there who do not believe, though they have seen the evidence. And since the evidence continues to come in, um, then I would say yes to your invitation for another interview for the sake of the people who still are wrestling and still need help discerning. And they, can, I mean, it really is truly this, this issue here. It's like, I can't believe it. When I first heard it, I remember. I can't believe this. Right. This is, if I was not looking at pictures right now, I, I wouldn't believe it at all. And then I still go on my own sabbatical to see it for myself. This is truly happening in our world by and large, not just at First Baptist Orlando, but this is really happening and it is staggering. So nevertheless, I think that, you know, you and I should do another video as well and yeah. and reveal even more staggering evidence. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
All right. Well, Casey, may God's blessings be yours, brother, uh, you and your family in your church there. And again, you are the pastor at Beulah Baptist Church, Winter Garden, Florida, outside of Orlando. So any, um, turn to the camera, any, any, any sheep out there in that general neck of the woods, and you're looking for a place to be fed, a place to be loved and shepherded, um, Beulah Baptist Winter Garden, Florida. There's other good churches in the Orlando area. I don't mean to say that there are, but, um, but this is one of them. So, all right, Casey, thank you very much, brother. And, um, appreciate you joining us and, uh, we'll do our next video soon. So dear ones, uh, thank you very much. I think you know this by now, if you've watched our videos that, uh, I take no joy in this. I, I am saying these things about the SBC as well as one who, I was going to a Southern Baptist church nine months before I was born. One of those kind of things. I was Southern Baptist for the first 37 years of my life. Got two degrees from a Southern Baptist seminary. So, so I say these things, I point these things out with, with sadness as well. Till our next time together, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all.